I could water ski at a fairly young age. My parents had a boat, and so my dad was from Minnesota. We just grew up with boats because that's just what you did in Minnesota. And so we were always out on the lake. I could ski with two skis. And around 12 years of age, my parents said to me, Jeff, you really need to learn how to slalom. And uh, they meant it. You know what slaloming is? Right? It's just one ski, okay? Skiing with one ski instead of two. So they're like, it is time to take this one and put it away. And I'll tell you what, man, I was freaking out because I, I am the older sibling in my family. And if you're an older sibling, you'll know, or if you have an older sibling, you know, the older siblings are conscientious. They clean up after themselves. They don't like to hurt people. And then you've got younger siblings, those of you who are younger siblings in here, I can tell who you are because it's just a little messier around you. <laughs> I'm just not joking. Nevertheless, right, so, right, the older child tends to be more conscientious, but the older children also tend to be more cautious, more, more careful, more fearful in a lot of ways. And so I, as the older child, didn't want to die. And so when my parents told me just one ski, in our family, it was not a suggestion. It was a need. You got to learn how to do this. I got in the water and I only tried halfway. You ever try anything halfway? It just doesn't work, right? I was like falling down and I didn't want to get up because it goes really fast on one ski. And when you hit that water, you're like, arr, 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 and it does not feel good. And I got back in the boat. I'm like, I'm not doing this. And I got in and said, I'm not doing it. And my brother, he said, I'll do it. As soon as my little brother said, I'll do it, I was back in that water. Sometimes it almost takes losing something before you decide to grab a hold of it. Y'all with me on that one, right? In my mind, I'm counting the cost. Okay, it seems dangerous. I could get hurt, but if I don't, my brother's gonna be first. I could look stupid. I could look really dumb, but if my brother does it first, I'm gonna look really dumb. And so I weighed the cost about me skiing versus my brother skiing first. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about weighing the cost, not just of water skiing, but the cost of following Jesus. I'm sure you've felt the tension of weighing the cost there as well. Like, should I eat a candy bar or should I stick with my diet? You're kind of weighing the cost of either one. The deal is, we love our comfort. We could live here forever. It is way easier to stay where you're at than it is to go out and get something done. Is that true? Is that true? Right? And so you got these questions in your mind. Like, should I turn that hobby into a job? It's risky. It's more rewarding. It takes a lot more work. Or should you just stay where you're at? Should you stay at home with your parent or should you move out? Should you get the new job or stick with a job you don't like, but it's comfortable? Are you going to work really hard on the homework or are you going to stay home and watch some TV and accept a C minus? See, we love our comfort. Give me a true if that's true. Right, we love it. The reality is though, you've gotta make a decision between your comfort and the next level. You've gotta make a decision between your comfort and the next level. And today, I'm gonna to ask you to think about what you're willing to sacrifice for Jesus. Today, we last week, we talked about decisions must be made. We said you can't stay where you're at. We had all these signs up here, the prophecies that pointed to Jesus, so we know that he really is the son of God. We had all the signs that we know that we'd made the right decision. And we said you've got to go one direction or the other. You've got to go with Christ or against him, but you can't stay in neutral. Today, for those of you who are saying, I want to go with Christ, I want you to know that there is a cost to following Christ. If you choose him, you're turning one direction and you're leaving the other things behind. Jesus gives us this example in Luke 14, 28. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? What's the point here? He's saying, it don't matter what you're gonna do, you always weigh the cost. You wanna see if you have what it takes. Let's go ahead and write this down. I must weigh the cost of following Jesus before calling myself a Christian. I must weigh the cost before calling myself a Christian. There are so many people in our culture today who call themselves Christians, even though they're the furthest thing from it. They think they're followers of Jesus just because they grew up in the Midwest and went to church when their grandma drugged them at eight years old. By the way, you do want your kids to have that drug problem, right? You want your kids to have the drug problem. Yeah, my parents drug me to church on Sunday. They drug me to church on Wednesday. They drug me to church all week long. That's the type of drug problem you want for your kids, amen? But you gotta set an example. 
you gotta show them that you're willing to give up your life to follow Jesus. It's this way every, I mean, if you get married, you gotta leave the single life behind. Otherwise, you're in trouble. If you wanna follow Jesus, you gotta leave the other stuff behind. Today's important because so many people in our culture have been taught that you can have Jesus and the world too. That's a lie. Today's important because if you don't count the cost, you don't really know what you're getting into when you follow Jesus. There's a cost to not following Jesus too. The rewards of knowing God himself who designed you and created you and has a plan for you. So if you all would open your Bibles, there's a Bible in the chair in front of you to Mark chapter one. We're just in the second week of this series here and we're studying the book of Mark written by a guy named John Mark. Now if you're new to the Bible, once you get to that page, there are chapter numbers, and the chapter numbers are big numbers. So the big number in a Bible is always a chapter, and the small numbers are always the verses. And so we want to start at chapter 1, verse 16. So you're going to find the big one, and you're going to come all the way down until you get that little tiny 16 right there. The guy who wrote this, his name's John Mark. We already studied last week, and last week Mark was pointing out that Jesus is the Son of God pointed out that John the Baptist came as prophesied. He pointed out many predictions about Jesus, and he's basically saying, you've got to make a decision. Either Jesus was the son of God or he wasn't, but you've got to decide what you're going to do. And today we're studying about some people who Jesus called out. This is verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, who is also called Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, kind of keep that part of the Bible open. We're going to come back there a little bit later. Peter and Andrew, Simon and Andrew, had met Jesus on a prior occasion, and they had had a longer conversation with him, most likely, as is recorded in John chapter one, and they had probably spent an afternoon with Jesus. This is important to know because you read this story, and it kind of sounds like some random guy named Jesus has walked up and was like, hey, uh, follow me, and they're like, I'm not doing anything better, why not? Like, it just, <laughs> Jesus just walked up and they followed. But they had already heard about Jesus, right? Jesus had thousands of followers. They were following him from all over. And John, uh, I mean, Peter and Andrew had seen John the Baptist. They had seen the fulfilled prophecies. They were probably debating in their fishing boat, do you think this is the guy? I bet this is the guy. Like, what are we gonna do, man? I think this is the guy we've all been waiting for. So when Jesus shows up and says, follow me, they had already had the debate in their, ni- in their mind about whether or not they wanted to follow Jesus. It's not like they agonized their decision for weeks or months. When Jesus came and said, follow me, it got real, real all of a sudden, didn't it? Like they're probably debating in the mind, is he the guy? I think he's probably the guy. What are we gonna do when he comes? Are we gonna listen to him? Then Jesus says, follow me. And let's look at the verse, okay? I like to, to dig into these verses one at a time. Verse 16 said, they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Okay, he's telling them what the job's gonna be. And at once, at once, let me, let me change the color of my marker here. It was black and I don't think you can really, let's see, blue. All right, can you, can you see the blue okay? Is that all right? At once, they left their nets and followed him. At once. What does this mean? It means like, boom. They dropped their nets and walked behind Jesus. They'd been thinking about Jesus for a little while. He says, follow me, and boom. Okay, so they were fishermen, which means they were probably middle class, maybe upper middle class citizens. They weren't rich, but they weren't poor. Okay? They had a good job. And Jesus tells them he's going to send them out to fish for people, which is actually a common phrase back then. They would have understood exactly what he meant. Jesus is saying, yeah, I want you to be my follower, but more than I want you to be my follower, I want you to tell other people about me so that they become my followers too. And so they realize this right away. And what do they do? They drop their nets and they leave their profitable business. And when do they do it? At once. Like immediately, they dropped it, they walk away. Now when it came to the water skiing, I was hesitating. I didn't wanna get hurt, I hesitated. You've hesitated with a job. You've hesitated about what to eat for dinner. But if you hesitate about Jesus, it might be too late by the time you change your mind. 
You don't want to wait till it's too late. You don't know when God's going to call your name and your day's going to come. We've all had friends or family members who died too early, haven't we? We all have people we know. We know it's a reality that we don't know when our time ends. We don't know when God's going to call us home. And when God calls us home, that's it. You don't get to make a decision anymore. You've already made it. You don't want to wait. Jesus is calling you. Now, there are some other guys in this story too. So that was verse 16 to 18. Verses 19 and 20, it says, there was James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. So you got these two brothers here. Without delay, he called them. So Jesus is jumping on this. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So we know that John and James had servants. So they were probably upper middle class. They may have been wealthy. They owned their own business. They had employees. They, and they too left their profitable business. And they left it at one, they just left it behind. Just like Peter and Andrew did. They left their sources of income to follow Jesus with no guarantee whatsoever. I want you to think about this. This is kind of a big deal. What would it take for you to leave your source of income right now to go do something that Jesus wants you to do and you have no idea what's gonna happen, whether you're gonna have enough food or money or any, you just don't know. Let's write this down. Like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the question is, would I be willing to follow Jesus if it cost me my job and all my income without any guarantee of what would happen next? Would you? There's a cost there. Some of you are thinking right now about the job you have and certain things they want you to do or certain things they don't want you to do that you know God wants you to do. This isn't theoretical. Right? They left their money, but they didn't just leave their money. What else did they leave according to this verse? Who, what? Yeah, their dad. They left their dad. Now, now this isn't in the Bible, but I imagine this is how it went. Their dad's standing there. He sees off in the distance this Jesus guy. Oh, there's that Jesus. He's that hippie guy all those kids are following. He's got that long hair. And James and John are like, oh, but that's Jesus. Like we were talking about him and we think he might be the Messiah. Jesus walks up and, and says, follow me. And the dad's working on his fishing nets because he doesn't give a hoot. And the kids, James and John, they're like, yeah. And they jump out of the boat and the dad's like, where are you going? They're like, we're going to follow Jesus. He's like, how long will you be gone? And they're like, bye. Dad looks at the employees. Did you know about this? <laughs> right? Like, what is happening? I mean, that's just an imaginary story, but it's actually a huge deal because many Jewish teachers at that time felt that the greatest commandment was to honor your parents. So to leave suddenly and leave your dad in the boat and to leave him behind without warning would have been beyond rude. Many of them would have considered it immoral. So these guys were following Jesus at the cost of their reputation, their father's business, and their own livelihood. Let's write this down. Like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, would I be willing to follow Jesus if it costs me my family and friends? There's a cost there. I kind of got into this TV show for a while called Alone. Anyone ever watched the show Alone? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, if you haven't watched it, you should definitely watch the series. It's on, I think it's Netflix. And uh, so what they do is they take 10 people and they allow them to pick a few supplies from a, an approved list. Like you can have a tarp or a knife or a hatchet, some a very small list of supplies. And they drop you off in the wilderness. And when I say the wilderness, I'm not talking Oakdale Park. I'm, ta I'm talking like in the, in the middle of Alaska, there's not a town for 40 miles and help can't even get to them for an hour. They have an emergency beacon, but they push it like it might be an hour before someone even gets to them. And so they're out there in the middle of nowhere with nothing except a few supplies. And the goal is to see who survives the longest. And it's actually a difficult and devastating journey. Of course, everybody who watches the show thinks they could do it. I, I, I was watching the show and a couple episodes in, I'm like, I could do that. I could probably win that. Never find, mind the fact that like I have a desk job and my, my idea of suffering is when I run out of Doritos, you know? <laughs> like, seriously, I don't even like putting tents up that I buy in the store. I'm like, who made these instructions? But these people are professional survivalists, boat makers, uh, fishermen, professional trappers, like real outdoors people. And they just fall one by one after weeks. Uh, like the longest they stay out is maybe two months. Some people quit on day two. 
on one of the, one of the series, uh, this guy, who was, he was like an outdoors guy. And I thought, this guy is probably going to win it. And he goes to sleep that night. And then like a bobcat comes sniffing around his tent and making noise. And he was like, forget it, I'm done. <laughs> forget it. He quits. But the hardest part isn't the wild animals. The hardest part isn't the fact that they almost starve for a month. The hardest part for them is leaving their families. Every single one of them thinks about, what's my wife doing right now? What are my kids doing right now? What if they need me right now? And they could win a huge cash prize. And they're all doing what they said they love to do, being in the wilderness. But the reason they quit is because they had to leave their family and they can't do it. What if you had to leave everyone and everything for Jesus? Would you do it? Could you do it? Luke chapter 14. Okay, we're studying Mark, but I want to bounce over to Luke really quickly. It says, in the same, Jesus is talking, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. I'm going to read this again. I want you all to shout out everything. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. I'm going to read part of this again, and this time you're going to say cannot. If you don't give up everything, he cannot be my disciple. Let's write this down. Jesus said, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus said, anyone who does not give up everything cannot, cannot be my disciple. He didn't say it gets hard to be my disciple if you don't give it. He said, you can't. You are ineligible to be my follower if you cannot give up everything. Everything. He's talking your home, your friends, your family, your job, your abilities, your vehicle, your clothes, your freedom. Picture that. You're alone. You got nothing left. You got no place to sleep. You got nothing to eat. There's no one beside you. They've all abandoned you. That's what Jesus is saying. Your life needs to be like if you want to follow him. You need to be willing to make it like that. Now, decisions are difficult. When my parents were asking me to ski on one ski, it was a relatively easy decision, but I had to weigh the cost this is going to be painful. Am I sure I want to do that? And you got to know the cost here to follow Jesus. I'm tell, telling you, some, someone here is new today, and they're probably like, I think this preacher is trying to convince me not to follow Jesus. What kind of church is this? Uh, I want you to follow Jesus, but I want you to do it in the way that Jesus said we had to do it, right? We can't say I'm a follower of Jesus and not do it the way Jesus told us to do it. And he says to give up everything. Now, this part of the Bible is written in Greek, And that seems really intense. And so I thought, well, what does the word everything mean in Greek? Like maybe there's a nuance to it that helps us understand what he really means. So I looked it up in Greek, and the word everything actually means everything. (laughs) Like it's actually a pretty good translation. (laughs) Everything. The the word that you, you could translate differently is this one, give up. Okay? Whoever does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. This, this word for, for give up could actually be translated wave goodbye. So, so write this down. One possible translation of what Jesus said is to say goodbye to everything. Now, I actually kind of like that translation better. Why do I like it better? Because if you're just leaving everything, if you're just giving it up, maybe you can get it back. But when you're saying goodbye, there's a finality to it, isn't there? It's, it's James and John in their boat looking at their dad going, goodbye. We love you. Goodbye. And they leave. They don't know if they're ever going back. And when Jesus says, I want you to give it up, I want you to say goodbye to it, he's saying, I don't know. I can't promise you that you're gonna get that house back. I can't promise you you're gonna get the job back. I'm asking you to wave goodbye and it's permanent. Like Peter and the other guys did. Jesus called them goodbye to their boats, goodbye to their job, goodbye to their life. This is crazy, but this is huge. Why did Jesus say this? I'm gonna, gonna, so this is Luke 14. A little bit earlier in the chapter of Luke, uh, we have, or a little bit later here, it says large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, so, So who's he talking to at this point? Large crowds. Large crowds are traveling with Jesus. Wherever he went, these people would follow. You've heard of like rock band fanatics who go wherever the rock band goes. 
uh, like some of you, uh, some of you, uh, you know, the Grateful Dead, right? They had like deadheads, right? That was a little before my time, but uh, there are other bands. People just follow. They go to like every concert. They follow the band around. Well, Jesus had these Jesus freak followers. No matter where he went, they would follow him around. That's a big deal, right? That's a big commitment to say, I'm just going to follow Jesus. If he goes to Capernaum, I'm going to, if he goes to Galilee, he goes to, if I'm going to Washington, D.C., I'm, like, I'm just going to follow Jesus. But Jesus sees these large crowds. Here's the rest of the verse. Large crowds are traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, hate his wife and children, hate his brothers and sisters, yes, even hates his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Write this down. Jesus is not impressed with people who want to follow him. Jesus wants people who know the cost and will pay the price. I love the fact that we have a larger building now. We can minister to more people. There were so many people who helped us do this. God really did a powerful thing here. And so now more people can come to Christ. And I'm praying every week that more people come to Christ and more people come to Christ because we'd love to fill. But if we fill this place with 2,000 people every Sunday morning and 2,000 people every Monday night and 20,000 people the rest of the week, Jesus wouldn't be impressed with the crowds unless the people were willing to leave everything behind for him. He saw the loud crowd, large crowds, and he said, why are you here? You can't even follow me if you're not willing to hate everything else in your life. He wants to know if those people, that large crowd, is willing to pay the price. So I'd like you to picture the scene. If you're looking at the beginning of the chapter, Luke 14, you see Jesus at the helm of a Pharisee. Now, Pharisees are really religious people. Jesus is sitting in the house. He's eating with them, hanging out with them. There's large crowds around, people around the house, people peeking in the windows, people in the door. The house is crowded. And the Pharisees were the most legalistic group of Jewish people that existed, okay? They had rules upon rules. And they were one of the groups that believed honor your father and mother was like the most important commandment. So the Pharisees held that their family life was very important. They regulated their family life. So Jesus is at the home of this Pharisee and these large crowds are there and in the middle of the Pharisee's home with all these religious people listening, he says, hey, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate their father and mother, you can't be my disciple. I bet you could have heard a pin drop in that house. Imagine you go into someone's house who believes that's the highest law and you say, you need to disobey that to follow me. Jesus doesn't, of course, literally mean you should hate your mother and father. He's using comparative terms. He didn't want you to kill yourself. But your love and your dedication for Jesus must be so strong that your feeling towards family and yourself would seem like hate comparatively. I want to check and see what, what questions we might. If you, if you got a question during the sermon, you can send a question to ask at revo.church. All right, so someone says, how literal should we be taking this? That's a good question. Uh, our screens right now for the question isn't working, but I still get them up here. So how literal should we be taking this? I, I think we all t take this as literally as each of us can. So for some of you, your mother and father are really happy that you're at a church, and they're really happy that you're following Jesus. And that is since there's really not a requirement for you to hate them compared to your love for Jesus, they would probably support you following Jesus no matter what it costs you, right? So that's good. For some of you, you have a family who your parents would be mad at you if you followed Jesus all the way. Maybe they're okay with you showing up to church, but the second you try to give more or do more, they, they get a little, well, I think you're spending too much time there. I think you're going a little overboard. And at that moment, you've got to decide whether you want to please your mommy or your Lord and Savior. Right there, literal, right there. How literally should we take it? As literal as it means for you. For some people, the parents aren't big. For some people, it's your, you love your home. And the fact you love your home so much prevents you from joining a growth group or going out and witnessing to your neighbors. You could sit inside, watch Netflix with your blanket and pillow all day long, and this would just be, this would be your happy place. You should hate your house. You need to get your butt off the couch and out there and meet your neighbor. Why? Because your neighbor's going to hell if they don't know Jesus. And your couch is preventing them from knowing Jesus. Does that make sense? 
So it's literal in that way. Some of you have a job that prevents you from being at church. You're so tired after you get off work that you can't even do your devotions anymore. And, and it's, it's like pushing you away from God and that money is keeping you away from the Lord. So what is it that's stopping you from being close to the Lord? That's where you need to take this really literally. All right, someone else said, why do you make Zebedee sound like he's the type of guy who says, get off my lawn? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, I don't know, I don't know, I have problems. All right, <laughs> someone says, so I should hate my wife and children in the most loving way, yeah. Uh, right, we, we still are required to treat people with honor and respect, no matter who they are, even our, right, Jesus even says, love your enemies. The point of this is that our love and commitment to Jesus Christ should be so much that no matter what we have to leave and no matter what we have to do, no matter who we have to upset, we're gonna follow Jesus, whatever the cost. Whatever the cost, all right? Now let's go back to the book of Mark. We've we've jumped out to Luke 14. We're gonna go back to Mark, but instead of chapter one, we're gonna fast forward to chapter eight because he says something similar. He called the crowd around him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now this is interesting, it sounds like poetic language, but but this is what condemned criminals had to do in their culture on the way to be executed. They had to carry their own cross to be crucified. People would line up and spit at them and make fun of them, and Jesus says, you gotta carry, you you gotta carry your cross and follow me. So we, we should be willing to die to follow Jesus physically or die to our other plans and ambitions. There's really not a way to overstate what Jesus is saying here. Carrying a cross is not just be loving to your annoying neighbors. A lot of people are like, oh, Christian, I know I'm a Christian because my neighbor barbecues late at night and it smells gross and I just, I'm kind to them anyway. I'm a good Christian. And I don't know why they walk like that, but. (laughs) Right, this is not telling you just be nice to people. It goes beyond that. This is saying you've got to be willing to die for Christ, to give up the things you love. Carrying a cross means losing everything. Carrying a cross means no more pride, no more strength, nothing. A cross is not a piece of jewelry. It was a means of executing people. This is the Roman government coming to kill you. Similar to us saying, if you want to come to the church, you must strap yourself into an electric chair. If we said that, people would go, man, that place is crazy. But this is exactly what Jesus said, isn't it? A cross was not jewelry, not a decoration, not a religious symbol. It was a means of dying a torturous way. Jesus said, you want to follow me? You got to be ready to die. Anything less is unacceptable, is what he says. You cannot be my disciple. The crowds of people that seemed dedicated to Jesus were the people he's telling this to. He's not saying this to people who everyone thought, oh, those are bad people. Jesus is teaching them a lesson. No, he's saying this to people who are considered holy and good, people who followed him wherever he went. That's who Jesus is saying this to. And he's telling them, you gotta count the cost and you've got to give up more. Now, grab your Bible. I chose you to come back to this. So grab your Bible again and flip back over to Mark chapter eight. So you're gonna find this on page 820. If you're, if you're using the numbers, the, the big eight is there, but the little numbers go all the way to that next page before you get to verse 34. So I wanna read you some context of what he said here. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now I'm on verse 35. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. What you saying here? You wanna save your life? You like what you've built? You like your life? You wanna save this? You can have it. You're gonna lose your life in the end because you've chosen this over Christ. What good is it, he continues, verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Like, what good is it to have the softest couch in the neighborhood and go to hell? What good is it to have the best job you could have and be apart from God? 
What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man, that's Jesus, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. That's a reference to Jesus coming back again. So Jesus is gonna come back sometime at the end of the world and Jesus is going to be our judge. A lot of people says, oh, Jesus is so loving. He is loving, but he's also the judge of the world. And he will judge the living and the dead, you and me and everyone who's ever existed. And right now, Jesus is saying, you gotta know the cost. There, there's a decision to be made and it, you, you gotta go one way or the other. The cost of not following Jesus is your soul. Oh, you, you'll get the world, man. If you don't want to follow Jesus, I am not here to pressure you. You go out, get the nice house, get the nice car, have sex with whoever you want, get drunk tonight, lie to your boss, do whatever you want. You be as happy as you can be now. It won't last very long. You'll get the world now, but you will lose your soul in the end. The cost of following Jesus, though, is high. You can win now and lose later, or you can lose now and win later. But I gotta tell you, the cost of following, let's just write this down. The cost of following Jesus is painfully high. Man, this guy really doesn't want me to follow Jesus. <laughs> I do, I just want you to know what you're getting into. You may need to leave things that you love. In fact, I guarantee every single one of you is gonna have to leave things you love. I wanna be clear. What we're not saying today is that you have to do these things to be saved. Right? No one goes to heaven by their own works. No matter how hard you try, you're not good enough to earn the grace of God. See, that we got, we got a problem. Every single one of us has done stupid stuff. Raise your hand if you've ever done stupid stuff. Yes, okay, I saw a couple of people who didn't. All right, good job for you. All right. So we've all done stupid stuff. We've all, it's called sin, right? We know we shouldn't do it. God told us not to do it. Our conscience said we shouldn't do it, but we did it anyway because it felt good in the moment. And because we've done it, we are judged by God. God's gonna come, he's gonna judge us, and the, eternal punish, the, the punishment for offending an eternal being is everlasting punishment. That's why Jesus came to the world, he went to the cross, he died for our sins. The only one who could die for our sins, because he was the son of God. He was an eternal son of God. So he could pay for our sins on the cross, so that you and I didn't have to. Scripture says if you believe that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead, and if you say Jesus is my Lord and accept his forgiveness, then you're saved. But you are saved by the grace of God. It's forgiveness, it's free, it doesn't cost you a thing. But once you say, I've been forgiven, now the cost comes. Because nobody who receives forgiveness of Jesus continues their life as they led before. Everyone who receives free grace from God gets changed on the inside out and it's gonna cost you something. In fact, if you're unwilling to pay the price to follow Jesus, then I would question whether or not you really accepted his forgiveness in the first place. Because his forgiveness changes you and it changes me. It changed Peter and Andrew and James and John to the point where they said goodbye to the road lives. We need to say goodbye to road lives. If you're a real follower, you'll give it up. Consider the stories of godly men and women who gave up their lives to follow Jesus. Like these are important stories and, and I think you should know some of these stories. You should read some of these books. Like there's a guy named Martin Luther. He was excommunicated by the Catholic Church on January 3rd, 1521. He was a, a priest in the Catholic Church but he saw all sorts of problems with the, with the church and so he had a willingness to die for Jesus. How did this come about? He saw the problems and he posted what's known as the 95 Theses the, the 95 problems that were, ha were in the Catholic Church. Now, he was a priest. He worked at their seminary. He was a well-known guy in the Catholic Church. And because he posted these 95 problems, the Catholic Church got back at him. They excommunicated him. And the emperor declared him to be an outlaw. They banned his writings. They demanded his arrest. The emperor made it illegal to house Martin Luther. So if you saw him, you couldn't invite him to your home. The emperor made it illegal to give him food. The emperor made it legal for anyone to kill Martin Luther on sight with no questions asked. But Luther continued his fight to have a pure church. Why? Because he cared about Jesus more than he cared about his own life. He weighed the cost, and the cost was high, and it was worth it. You have maybe heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
right? They, they, they lived a long time ago. The Bible tells the story about how they worked under a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And the king made an idol and said, everybody had to bow down to this idol. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were Jewish people. They said, no, we're not going to bow down to that idol. And so the king brought them in his presence. And, and the punishment for not bowing down would be to be burned to death. And this is Daniel chapter 3 in the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. What did they say? I love this story. I love this quote. What did they say? They said, oh, you want to worship the idol? Guess what? We're not going to do that. You can throw us into the furnace and God will save us. And even if he doesn't, screw you. <laughs> Maybe that last part wasn't very Christian. Maybe that wasn't the last idol. But you get the point, right? He said, even if you kill us, don't matter. I'm not bound down to your idol even if it costs me my life. High cost, high commitment, no matter what. Amen. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. There's a guy named Jonathan Edwards, very highly regarded scholar. He was a preacher and pastor. He's considered American's most original philosophical theologian. Very smart guy. He would study for like 13 hours a day, so he was smarter than us, okay? And Jonathan Edwards made a list of 70 resolutions by which he said he was gonna live his life. You should read the whole list sometime. It's a fascinating list. But I want to read you resolution number seven. Resolved. Never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. What does this mean? If I knew that I was going to come face to face with God in 60 minutes, would I be doing what I'm doing right now? And if I wouldn't, then I best never do it. If I'm having sex with someone I'm not married to, and I know I'm meeting God in five minutes, would I, would I be doing that? No. Then I shouldn't do it. If I'm taking stuff from my workplace, I got no business taking, and I'm taking it home because nobody notices, would I do that if I was gonna meet God in 30 minutes? No. I shouldn't do it. He's saying I've got a high standard of living, a high standard, and I should not waver from that high standard. It's a standard he stood for even when his church fired him for preaching something they didn't like. I consider myself a really blessed pastor because the more I offend y'all, the more you like it. So that's nice. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> like that's, that's a good sign, you know, because people are like, that hurt, thank you. I'm like, okay. But it's a standard we should all follow, right? When your friends abandon you for doing what God wants, yes. When the boss fires you for not cheating a customer and making more for the business, good job. When you wake up in the morning instead of sleeping in so you can spend time with God, yes. You're weighing the cost of these things and some of them are painful, but it's worth it. Are you willing to follow Jesus? There is a cost. It may be your popularity. It may be your money. It may be your comfort. In fact, it almost certainly is your comfort. Will you follow Jesus knowing that he demands everything? Will you follow Jesus knowing he demands everything? I want to see if any more questions came in real quick. Uh, not yet. Okay. Luke 14, 33 says this. In the same way, any of you who does not give everything he has cannot be my disciple. So knowing that, I want you to look at your outline and don't circle the answer yet, but this is the question that God is asking you. Are you willing to pay the cost that Jesus demands? Understand that it's much more than a circle on a paper. It's more than a powerless word. It is you and your soul, your thoughts and decisions. It is your decision. If you decide, yes, then you will be willingly giving your life to Christ and you will have a high price to pay. If you decide no, then you don't have any cost to pay at all. You can go home and do whatever you want today, live a good life. Your cost comes later. If you do not circle one, you've not chosen to follow Jesus and you have chosen the way of the world. 
Here's a suggestion I have for all of us when we're deciding how far do I wanna take this Jesus thing. I suggest we read some books about people who've chosen to give their life for Jesus. You can write this down, practical application. Reading books of martyrs and great Christians who sacrificed are actually encouraging and increase my desire to live boldly for God right now. So instead of feeding my mind on fictional nonsense, why not read the biographies of great men and women of God? And I don't mean all fiction is nonsense, but there is some fictional nonsense out there. You know what I'm talking about, right? That's some really bad books. So why not open up some books like uh, 50 People Every Christian Should Know? These are 50 short stories or little biographies about 50 people you should know who love the Lord and follow him. Like this guy here, it's Charles Spurgeon. I'm reading a whole book about him right now. Just amazing men and women of God. Here's another book called Jesus Freaks and Fox's Book of Martyrs. So Jesus Freaks is an updated version of Fox's Book of Martyrs. And what these books are, it is an actual retelling of people who gave up their life for Jesus. So it'll say 1857, the setting was Germany, and this is what happened, and here's why this person was persecuted, and here's why they decided to follow Jesus, and here's how they died. It's an amazing book. In fact, as I was thinking about this, I, was, I went to a movie on Friday, I think it was Friday, and I found out there's another movie coming out this fall called Bonhoeffer about a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Any of you know who that is? Oh my goodness, this guy. He was a pastor who wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Basically, the book is an expanded version of the sermon today. Uh, he, he says this in his book, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So when you were called to Christ... On offers says, when you receive forgiveness, Jesus wasn't like, come on, let's go on rides. He was like, come on, let's go die. And he took this seriously because Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany when Hitler came to power. And he fought against Hitler. He preached against Hitler. He taught his church against Hitler. He was involved in an assassination plot against Hitler. He was a pacifist pastor who thought Hitler was so, anyway, you gotta watch the movie, read the book, but he, he was put into a concentration camp for a year and a half and then he was hung as a traitor. He believed when Christ said to come, you must die for those convictions. He was not a fan of churches that preached cheap grace. What's cheap grace? Well, he says this. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace is baptism without church discipline. Cheap grace is communion without confession. When you come to church here and you get baptized, one of the things we ask is, are you in a growth group? Are you in a small group? Who's holding you accountable? Because we don't want people to be baptized unless they're gonna be held accountable for their life. We say people need jerk what? Jerk, <laughs> jerk friends. If, a, if you're new to here, a jerk friend is someone who loves you enough to tell you what you don't wanna hear. They'll tell you, man, you are supposed to be following Jesus. This is not the way to go about it. You don't want cheap grace in your life. You if you're going to a church and they tell you, love, forgiveness, God cares about you, but they never say, you gotta stop your sin, church has problems. We want repentance along with the forgiveness. So read those books. Watch that movie about Bonhoeffer. Uh, there's a book called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. I read this book a number of years ago. It changed my life. Hudson Taylor wanted to be a missionary in China. So he got a job in, in his home area of Britain. He lived on his own. He studied Chinese. He, he didn't have enough money for actual study materials. He didn't, there's no Duolingo back then. So he got a Chinese Bible and an English Bible, and he taught himself Chinese by comparing them. That's crazy. But God was his one consuming purpose. So studied Chinese so he could go to China and be a missionary. But in the meantime, he wanted to tell all his neighbors about Jesus, everybody he could. And this is what he said. Butter, do we have the quote? Butter, milk, and other luxuries I ceased to use. <laughs> you ever heard someone call butter a luxury before? I ceased to use butter and milk. Go oh, wait, go back. We're not done yet. That's okay, I forgive you. <laughs> Buttermilk and other luxuries I ceased to use and found that by living mainly on oatmeal and rice with occasional variations, a very small sum was sufficient for my needs. In this way, I had more than two-thirds of my income available for other purposes. And my experience was that the less I spent on myself, the more I gave to others, the fuller of happiness and blessing did my soul become. He was 19 years old. Total focus on his purpose. The people in our culture, they look up to people who live in luxury and self-indulgence. Hudson Taylor lived on oatmeal and rice, and he did more than any of them ever will. 
in the eyes of God. Wikipedia even says about him, Hudson Taylor and his ministry were responsible for bringing over 800 missionaries to the country, China, who began 125 schools and directly resulted in 18,000 Christian conversions, as well as the establishment of more than 300 stations of work with more than 500 local helpers in 18 provinces. This man did so much for Jesus because he's willing to sacrifice so much for Jesus. He was a man who did not lose focus. I'd like to leave you with a, 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 just a couple last thoughts, okay? Uh, someone once asked Jesus a question about how hard it was to get into heaven, and Jesus said it was a very narrow door. And he says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. He says it's a narrow door, meaning people can't fit in there. They can't, there's gonna be people who try to get into the kingdom of God, but they can't get in. He doesn't mean like, They're not capable enough. It means they're like, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to enter the kingdom of God. And they were not willing to put it down what they love to enter. So they can't go in because the door's narrow and they're holding on to too much stuff from their life. So they can't go. One more thing before we go. One more verse before you go. Because you have to get this, okay? There is a cost to follow Jesus, but there's also rewards to follow Jesus. Like if someone were to say, well, doesn't God want me to be happy? Doesn't God want me to be happy? Yes, 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 God wants you to be happy, but not with a temporary comfort, not with a momentary gladness. He wants you to be happy in the biggest, longest, most massive way possible. Jesus says this in the book of Mark chapter 10. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this age and the age to come. Let's write this down. God does want me to be happy, but not with a temporary happiness. He wants me to be holy now and obey his commands now so I will have ultimate, long-lasting happiness beyond my wild imagination, wildest imagination later on. Your rewards will go far beyond what you could possibly imagine. You can't even, if you, if you gave up a job to follow Jesus now, the, the, the work you would do in the next life would be so much better, you couldn't even compare it. If you give up a home to follow Jesus now, if it's a tiny little home, you're gonna have a mansion beyond compare in the next life. If you abandon an income and you lose $50,000 a year to follow Jesus now, you're gonna have the equivalent of millions in the next life. Someone says, does that last verse mean we receive a hundredfold in this age too, as in our lifetime? That sounds contrary to what we just learned. Because uh, he says, in this age and the age to come. So the point Jesus was making here is twofold. That you sometimes do receive blessings from following Jesus now. Like you do. I mean, you, you, we just went through a, a 13-week series on prayer. And you know God wants to answer our prayers. And when you follow Jesus, sometimes you're blessed beyond what you could possibly imagine. I've never said that God won't bless you now. I just said you need to be willing to abandon things now for reward later. Because Jesus doesn't promise it's not guaranteed you're gonna get the reward now. You can get it now or you can get it later. He also does end this verse, if you look a little bit further, he says, and also troubles. (laughs) So yeah, you're gonna get troubles in this world. But you can get rewards in the next life. And that's what I want you to remember. The cost is high, but it's worth it. If you are here today and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus for that first time, to give up your life for him, I want you to put it on the red card that's in that chair in front of you. Everyone every week fills out this red card, but I'd love for you to mark that you're ready to follow Jesus, you're ready for baptism. Put it in one of these red boxes by the door that you leave today. Because it's a difficult path to follow and I wanna be able to walk with you in it. I want to get you connected with the church. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we love you so much. And I know the cost of following you is high and there are people in here today who want to follow you, but they're afraid to let go of something. So I just pray that you would be with them, that you would give them eyes to see what you have for them, that you'd help them to have eyes to see how little it is compared to what you're bringing in the next life. Lord, we give you our all. Whatever you want from us, Lord, use us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Go get those rewards now.